going to talk about Databricks. You might have guessed that. I mean, I've been using it on a number of client engagements recently and been you know, pretty impressed with the, the flexibility and performance. Um, I'm going to start this session, though, with some slides from Databricks themselves to help explain the positioning from their point of view. So Databricks was formed about five years ago by the same six people who created the Spark engine, which was the first unified engine for processing both big data and machine learning. Their stated goal was to help companies accelerate their innovation cycles by bringing together data, um, science, data engineering, and business to democratize the data and the science to allow customers to use the platform for a business advantage. A recent survey on AI adoption found that the majority of companies are either investing or planning to invest in AI initiatives, but that just 17% had managed to move an AI product, project to production and that it was taking an average of six months to bring those AI projects to deployment. This slide again, so Trevor, yeah, Trevor's shown this already, um, but this, this diagram from Google shows uh, an illustration of the capabilities the company needs to have to be successful at AI. And as uh, Trevor said, you know, the ML code um, is, in this diagram, the smallest component. So everything else is about collecting, verifying, preparing data, configuring and managing, the cloud-scale um, cloud infrastructure, and that's really where the heavy lifting is. And so ultimately, ultimately, Databricks is being positioned to help with these challenges around delivering AI. But what fundamentally is Databricks, and how does it help? Well, as I've already said, it was created by the team who founded Spark, and is essentially Spark extended to an enterprise-ready tool. It's a cloud-based service, and it's uh, integrated with both Azure and AWS. And it uses a cluster of computers, which provides sca scalable parallel processing and in-memory computation. Databricks automates the setup of these computers and handles the auto-scaling, which makes sure that you're only really paying for the uh, processing when you need to use it. Databricks uses notebooks, which are broken into different command cells. And these allow for incredible flexibility. The Databricks actually supports a number of different languages and allows you to use the most appropriate language in each cell within the same notebook. Many of the popular machine lang language frameworks are also integrated. And finally, Databricks has enterprise-level integrated security. So Databricks has really quickly risen in popularity and recently came 13th on Forbes Cloud 100 list. And we see two main applications of the technology, as Ethan just described. The first application is for data engineering, particularly with more um, companies embracing cloud data ar architecture. It provides data engineering at scale and offers a lot of flexibility. It can connect to a variety of data sources um, and data types for input and output. As I've said, there are multiple languages and also other libraries available to transform the data. And the autoscale functionality particularly lends itself um, to regular data loads where lots of power is required for a short period of time. Databricks, as I also mentioned already, has great performance compared to some of the more traditional data engineering tools. It uses in-memory computation for transformations rather than disk-based processing that's used in something like MapReduce that people may be familiar with. In fact, um, Spark, uh, the Spark engine can be 100 times faster than something like MapReduce. And it can run the loads and transformations in parallel by distributing its workload across different nodes. And then the second application is for data science. And again, it's the flexibility that really comes to the fore here. It's very useful to be able to switch between languages and use whichever machine language framework you wish to use to approach your business question. And users can display their analysis in a very readable format in notebooks, which I'll show in a minute. And this allows for easier understanding and easier developer collaboration. Quick overview of the uh, key components. So AWS or Azure will set up the Databricks workspace. But the workspace itself uh, is on Databricks Online. And all the coding, all the data storage you do within Databricks is held within Databricks Online. Within the Databricks workspace, we will need at least one cluster and uh, at least one notebook. So the cluster is one main computer called the driver node and several other computers called worker nodes. The driver interprets sort of the code that we're writing, the run commands, 
and the actual processing workload is distributed across the worker nodes. Clusters are really easy to set up. They take seconds to spin up in Databricks. The notebook itself is made up of cells of code, and each cell has its own output, which you can run individually or in sequence. And I'll show you a notebook in a couple of minutes. So I'm going to have a, a demo to show a simple sort of data engineering example initially. So in this demo, I'm going to use Databricks within Microsoft Azure, but the same could be done within AWS. This diagram shows a sort of similar uh, version of the architecture that Evelyn was showing with AWS, but within an Azure architecture. And it shows where Databricks might fit within that end-to-end -end architecture. You would typically expect to load um, multiple data sources into uh, some sort of raw layer. And this is often orchestrated as a straight copy of your source data, leaving the data as is, using a tool such as Azure Data Factory. But then Databricks is really used for transforming and enriching the data to optimize it for business use. And we'll also see, as I mentioned, that Databricks has a key role to play in data science and machine learning, which I'll look at in a later example. So I'm going to start by looking at data in my data lake. This is uh, Azure Data Storage Explorer, a tool that allows me to look at the data in my data lake, and a data lake effectively being a collection of folders and files. So here I have in my raw folder some data that's been um, loaded straight in from a source system as is. It's a simple example of sales data for a confectionery biscuit company, and the associated master data for product, store, and time. You can see here that the... Uh, file um, of size of this CSV file in sales is about 350 meg. So it's not absolutely massive, but it's not trivial either. This is a Databricks notebook, and you'll pretty quickly see that it's very code-based. But this is all accessed and run through a browser, and effectively, you know, I'm connecting here to Databricks Online, and I'm going to attempt to run a live demo, so it's bound to fail at some point, but we'll give it a go. Within my notebook, I have different command cells. You can see here, as well as having the code, I can lay out you know, simple comments and titles to make it a bit more readable. And within a command cell, I can execute a single command cell, or I can run the whole notebook. Now, this first step is uh, creating what's called widgets, um, which allows me to parameterize the notebook. At the top here, you'll see I've got a parameter for the source um, location of my data and a parameter for the output path. Um, now, this notebook can then be called by other tools and parameters can pass in to make it very dynamically run. Typically, uh, in the architecture I showed, Azure Data Factory would be used to pass in parameters and dynamically run notebooks. You'll see at the top here that I've, um, this notebook is actually set to run in Python. That's the default language for this, but I'll show you uh, a little bit later that you can switch to different languages. But these first few steps are in Python. So, my first step, um, after creating the parameters, is to load in my da data. I can use a sh keyboard shortcut to run the cell. And what this is doing is, uh, is just loading in those four files I just showed you into data stores within Databricks called data frames. I can then start using uh, Python commands to look at that data I've loaded, so my time data frame. I can look at the schema that it's inferred from the data. And that sales data, that sales file I've just loaded, that 350 meg file, that loaded in in a few seconds, you can see it's got 10, 10 and a half million rows. So again, like I said, not absolutely massive, but certainly not trivial either. I can look at data within a table. So let's have a look at my product data that I've just loaded in. You can see the products that i am um, got sales related to. And you'll notice here that I've got some null values, some missing um, attributes. Now that's not going to be very good when I get push this through to the business and for reporting usage. It's going to look a bit odd on our, in our reporting tool. So again, I'm going to run another Python command, simple Python command, to replace those null values with uh, NA. If I look at my product data again, you'll be able to see now that those null values have been replaced with NA. And now I'm going to switch to doing some stuff with SQL. So the first thing I'm going to do is going to transform um, those data frames, those data stores, into SQL tables, Spark SQL tables within Databricks. And then I'll be able to start using SQL to do my transformations, if that's more appropriate for what I want to do. I want to join together tables here, and that's typically easier in SQL. 
So here, here what I'm wanting to do is taking my sales data, joining it to my product time store, bringing through specific attributes that I need for my reporting, as well as specific metrics, and um, ultimately creating a sort of denormalized table of data that's going to be used for reporting and maybe is optimal for a tool such as Tableau, which likes data in that format. To notify Databricks that I'm not using the default language of Python, I've got this, uh, what's called a magic command, percent SQL, to tell it that this command cell will run using SQL. And I can run that view. And I can do a count from that view, at this time using SQL rather than Python. And you see we still have the 10.5 million records there. So a couple of simple transformations and joining of data. And now what I want to do is write out my data to a, a, a separate folder in my data lake, which I've called my enriched folder. So here I'm selecting the data from the view I've created, writing out to my parameterized output path. I can choose whether to write this out as a single file or partition it. I've chosen to partition this by week to make it more easy to, to use. And I can write it out to different types of file types. So I could have written it back out to CSV. But you'll see here, uh, I'm actually writing it out to a format called Parquet, which is optimized for data lake storage. I've also included some print commands in this um, code, which means that when it runs, it prints out some of the code that, that I've dynamically created, and that makes it really easy for testing and debugging. In fact, if I ran this as a production notebook being called from the data factory and it failed for some reason, I could go and look at the runtime of that particular run, look at any code that's output, and help to debug any issues. So having uh, run that, I'm going to switch back to my data lake. I'm going to go to a different folder, my enriched folder. You'll see within here I have lots of partitions for all my different weeks. Uh, if I look in one of those partitions, you'll see I've got a parquet file of that week's data with a nicely named uh, file um, there and some information files. So because that's not very nicely named, actually what I'm going to do in my last step <coughs> is to run uh, another Python command this time that um, calls a different Python library, which allows, allows me to manipulate files in the data lake directly. So I'm just going to simply loop through the files anywhere that it's a sort of information file, metadata file, I'll just remove that, I don't need to keep that. And anywhere that it's a Parquet file, I'm going to rename it to something more sensible. So if I go back to my data lake and refresh, you'll see now I've, got, I've lost those information files and I've got a sensible um, naming. Now this week's data has about, it's about 200K in size. And I've got about 60-odd weeks of data. So 60 times 200K, I think, is around about 12 meg of data, um, as compared to the 350 meg of data when stored as a CSV in the input. I haven't lost any sales data, trust me. Well, those 10.5 million records are still there, but it, it um, shows that the Parquet format is particularly uh, optimized for compressed storage. So um, pretty simple demo in terms of the transformations we were doing, but hopefully that's shown some of the flexibility and performance you can get with Databricks. So the flexibility in terms of being able to switch between, say, Python and SQL, being able to test and debug my code and uh, view comments very easily, and the performance of being able to take 10.5 million rows, load it in, carry out some transforma transformations, join with other um, data, data, and then write that back out to the data lake, and all of that took a matter of seconds. I'm going to switch now onto another um, part of Databricks called Delta Lake. Delta Lake is effectively another storage layer. Um, and its main purpose is to bring more readability to data lakes. The data under the sort of hood of um, Delta Lake uh, storage is uh, Parquet data, the, the, the format I just showed you. And that's pretty important because many tools are, know how to work with Parquet. But what Delta Lake really brings on top of that is some of the functionality that you might typically expect when you're storing data in a more structured format, like in a database or a data warehouse. So bring some of that reliability into files uh, stored in a data lake. For example, um, ACID transactions. So some of you who know databases may know what that means. It stands for Atomic, uh, Consistent, Isolated, Durable. Uh, and basically means that when you're loading data, if something fails halfway through, you're not going to get a partial data set there that's sort of invalid. It will make sure you're, you're, you've got valid data. Um, schema enforcement, so in a database, you're probably used to defining schemas and structures to ensure data integrity. So having this in your data lake allows the same functionality within files so that you're not going to get caught out by data structure or data formatting issues. 
One really interesting feature of Delta Lake is the ability to combine the processing of batch and real-time data into one platform. So without having to rewrite your analysis, you can always be running on the most up-to-date data. And finally, a feature that I'll show quickly in a minute. It's called audit history, also known as time travel. And this, um, when you store data in Delta format, will automatically keep track of changes to your schema and changes to your data. A really nice um, feature that I'll, sh I'll show in a second. And all of this is added to a completely scalable data lake platform. And all of these features are designed to work really efficiently at that scale. Now, Delta Lake was offered as part of Databricks initially, but as of April this year, they've actually released it as an open source project. So you can use this independently of Databricks now. Databricks does, of course, have some level of optimization when you use a Delta Lake that tends to perform better, and also obviously includes all the other features of Databricks. Let's have a very quick look at this in practice. So I'm going to switch back to my same notebook I was looking at earlier. And my first step I'm going to do sorry, is to um, create a table of data from the view that I already had uh, in Delta storage format. You can do that in a number of ways, depending on the languages and the data types you're using. But in this, state, in this example, uh, using a SQL statement, I'm simply um, using the using Delta command to, uh, to create this table in Delta storage. Let's have a quick look at some of the data in that table. So I'm just going to look here at my sales um, by store and order that by the highest number of sales. So we can see here that Leeds is uh, the biggest selling store in my data set. And so I'm going to remove it. Let's get rid of Leeds da data by deleting that data from my store. And when that's run, I can run the same SQL statement. Again, I'm just you know, normal SQL statement now to look at that uh, data stored in Delta formats. And you can see I've lost my leads data, as you would expect. So this is where the time travel comes in. So the first thing I'll do is I'll have a look at the history of this table. And this shows me two versions of my table. Version 0 is created. Um, and then version 1 created a, a few seconds later. Um, with my delete operation. So I can see any changes that have been made to my data, both in, in terms of schema changes or data changes. But not just can I track the changes, oops, I can also go and view the data of, in different versions. So I can run the same SQL statement that I've been running, but this time with this version as of zero command, so that I can run the um, data against the original version of data. And you see leads data showing up there also show differences between versions. So this statement is asking me to show the uh, data from my version 0 of the table, um, excluding anything that's in version 1. So effectively showing anything that I've removed from the table between versions. And as you'd expect, that's just showing a bunch of leads data. And then um, finally, I can not just uh, reference specific versions, but I can actually put specific timestamps in. So if I want to say, well, what was the data looking like at 10.07? Oh, that's not the right. Let's have a look at what time would, would work for this demo. Uh, 10.06 would be better. Then that will work out from which version was valid at that time and show the data at that point in time. I'm going to go through uh, a, an example which brings together a bit of data engineering and data science uh, with Databricks. So this is an insurance pricing example around looking at um, calculating premiums for third-party motor insurance. We have a lot of historical data about the types of vehicles that are on policies, the, type of, uh, the attributes about the policyholder, and we have historical data about the, site, the, the sort of number of claims that have been made and the value of claims. And what we want to do is use that historical data to um, predict uh, the likelihood of future claims and the, the severity of those claims so that we can calculate how much we should charge as a premium. So this is just an example of some of the aggregation of some of the data. So we've got data for different areas, the number of policies we're including in our sort of historic data set. 
how often they've been uh, claimed and, and how severe those claims were. So we want to be able to predict from that historic data for a specific policy holder, how many times are we expecting them to claim, what is the expected size of that claim, and therefore how much is, the, um, is it likely to cost us and therefore what should we charge them as a premium. And we're going to use some analytics algorithms to do that. We're going to use the Poisson generalized linear model uh, to work out the frequency. And we're going to use gamma GLM, a skewed non-negative distribution, to work out the severity. Don't worry if you don't follow that. <laughs> it's just an example of uh, some analytics. Here is my notebook. Here you'll see I've, I've actually got this defined as an R notebook this time, so I'm using a different language again. <coughs> I'm setting some parameters, I'm connecting to a data source, and then I start loading in my data. You can see here I've got, I can view my table of data. What I didn't show actually before is that you can also view this in different um, visualizations. Uh, so if I want to have a look at and sense check my data or uh, look for patterns and trends in my data, I can do that easily within the tool as well. I then um, need to carry out some level of data engineering. So I'm going to do some manipulation of the data. I'm going to use here um, a combination of Python and R to manipulate and do my data engineering and get the data in the right shape for the models. I'm then going to build my frequency model using the Poisson model, uh, this time in using R. And I can actually, again, visualize within um, uh, Databricks some of the parameters and the outputs from that algorithm, how and how they're going to affect my model. So this is really surfacing an R visual directly within Databricks. I'll then build a severity model to predict what size claims we're likely to be from the, um, from the parameters. And I can, again, visualize, visualize those. I've also included here at the top different parameters. So I can actually run this model. I've, I've created these parameters as drop downs this time. So I can actually put in different combinations of uh, types of vehicle, policy holder age, etc., to run this notebook. And at the end here, I can test this model by uh, running that prediction for the specific parameters uh, that I've input at the top. And that will then output my expected, for that combination of parameters, my expected frequency and severity of claim, and therefore what my premium should be. Again, relatively quick demo, I went through that quite quickly, but it's just showing that within the same tool, I can do my data loading, data manipulation, my different analytics models. I can use a combination of R and Python, or I can switch to SQL. And of course, um, because it's in Databricks and it has that order scaling and clustering uh, functionality, I can run that at a very fast across a uh, you know, large number of nodes if I want to, to run that when I want to very quickly. That pretty much brings us to the end of the session. Uh, how to get started Databricks if you wanted to? Well. We can help you get up and running with Databricks if you need help. We can help you understand your key use cases and how Databricks could be used to enhance your solutions. We can help set up Databricks and other cloud capabilities as needed. We can show you how you can use Databricks as a key tool for data engineering and data science. And we can also help with deploying Databricks, whether it's in Azure or AWS. So if you're interested in any help getting started with Databricks, feel free to talk to me or one of my colleagues. That concludes this session. Thank you very much.